Income tax 2023-2024. Education credits overview. Get ready and some coffee. Staying alert so you don't find income tax preparation to be too taxing. Most of this information can be found in the form 8863 education. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as excel practice problems pdf files and more like quickbooks backup files when applicable so once again click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it education credits american opportunity and lifetime learning credits instructions tax year 2023 which you can find on the irs website at irs.gov irs.gov we're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live remember in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement the bottom line taxable income similar to net income for an income statement basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula but it's only half the story half the battle half the income tax equation we then are going to take that taxable income calculate the tax on it not using a flat tax but rather a progressive tax system as well as other rates for certain types of income that might be subject to other rates other than ordinary income but that gets us to the tax before credits and other taxes so we're focused here on the credits remembering that credits are similar to deductions in that deductions and credits are both good for us as taxpayers but a dollar of a credit would simply decrease the taxable income on the income statement part of the formula only giving us a benefit depending upon the tax brackets that we're in whereas a dollar credit on the bottom part of the income tax formula would give us the full dollar of benefit if we had tax liability in order to cover it if that credit is up here in what we would call the non-refundable credits area so that's going to be the credit and then the other taxes include things like self-employment tax for example if we're a sole proprietorship finally getting us to the total tax total liability before we apply the payments already made which of course include things like w-2 withholdings estimated tax payments and the refundable credits which are credits that do allow us to take a tax liability uh, below zero in essence and therefore using the tax code not to collect taxes in that instance but as a safety net uh, social or welfare type of program in that instance so those would be the refundable credits which finally gets us to the tax refund or tax due now we're looking at credits that are related to education so we're typically thinking about people that are going to higher education generally college at a qualified institution which we'll get into shortly if that is the case the institution will typically provide a form 1098t now remember when you see forms that look like this the first thing that comes to mind is probably a 1099 form and remember how the irs works we have an income tax system how can the government double check that we are paying our taxes reporting our income they can pressure the person that is paying and to rat out the person that's being paid to typically so in an employee employer situation for example you have the employer that is paying the government says do you want to get a deduction they say of course i do it's a big deduction for the wages they say well then you have to give us a w-2 and you have to actually give us withholdings on that information as well if they're not an employee but a contractor do you want the deduction the business says yes they say well then you have to give us a 1099 ratting out who you gave the money to so we can go to their side to see if they had income now in certain instances when we're talking about large institutions the irs basically can say do you want to stay in business do you want to get loans from us educational grants and loans and and whatnot for loan programs if so then you're gonna to have to give us reporting information for tax purposes that we need we see this when we talk about banks 
with regards to home loans, where you're usually going to get a form showing the amount of interest you pay on a home loan uh, in that situation. Here we have an institution, which is a school, which is often going to be tied intimately, at least to like loan programs and whatnot, uh, with the government helping to fund uh, the institution in one way or another. And so, of course, the IRS is going to say, if you want to have access to that stuff, the government, then you need to be providing the form 1098T and be in compliance with that. So that's what we are seeing here. It's, it's not related to income, but related to expenses that we paid, possibly for qualifying tuition that we then could be able to apply in some format, typically to a credit, if not a credit, possibly a deduction in some cases. That's what we're looking at now. We're focusing in on education credits, which is the American Opportunity Credit and Lifetime Learning Credit, Form 8863. Now, remember that when we're talking about one set of costs for higher education, for example, we can't typically double dip. We can't take like that same dollar amount, apply it to American Opportunity Credit, a lifetime learning credit, and maybe deduct it somewhere else, right? That would be double dipping. What we, what we would then do then is decide which of these do I qualify for and, and, then, and then how would I maximize my tax benefits? Now, usually, the way you maximize your tax benefits is you first try to apply out the money that you're paying to for the American Opportunity Credit because that usually gives you the larger benefit, but it's more restrictive. If you can't get that, then you default to the Lifetime Learning Credit. And if you can't get that, then you might see if you can deduct the expenses somewhere else as a deduction, possibly rather than a credit. That's the general thought process that we're trying to think through. And that's why on this form, you can see both of the credits kind of combined together. You can almost think of them as one credit with regards to the calculation. We try to get the bigger one and then we and then we go for the for the smaller one, right? So this or the one with the most benefit to the less least benefit. This is the page two of the form 1040 where we're looking at, at the credits on page number two. All right, reminders. Limits on modified adjusted gross income. So first we're gonna get into some of the reminders. If you don't have any idea about this credit, we'll get into the nitty ditty, uh, the nitty gritty and the detail. But if you already have some idea about the credit, we'll first touch on some of, of uh, the reminders here. So limits on modified adjusted gross income, uh, MAGI. Uh, adjusted gross income is typically what is used to phase out the credit as income levels go up. So the Lifetime Learning Credit and the American Opportunity Credit, MAGI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income, limits are $180,000 if you're married filing jointly, $90,000 if you're filing single, head of household, or qualifying surviving spouse. Now, these are numbers that often we look on from year to year because you would think that they possibly would adjust from year to year with uh, regard to or in reaction to inflation. So see table one and instructions for line three or line 14. All right, so then we have the form 1098T requirement. To be eligible to claim the American Opportunity Credit or the Lifetime Learning Credit, the law requires a taxpayer or a dependent to have received form 1098T tuition statement from an eligible educational institution, whether domestic or foreign. So if you're going to a qualified institution, you will typically be receiving the uh, 1098T. And if you don't get that, you want to be pressuring the school to give you that because remember, they're not only giving it to you, but also to the government typically. So however, you may claim one of these education benefits if the student doesn't receive a form 1098T because the student's educational institution isn't required to furnish a 1098T, which is a little bit unusual to the student under existing rules. For example, if the student is a qualified non-resident alien, has certain qualified education expenses paid entirely with scholarship, has certain qualified education expenses paid under a formal billing arrangement, or is enrolled only in courses for which no academic credit is awarded. So if uh, a student's educational institution isn't required to provide Form 1098-T to the student, you may claim one of these education benefits without a Form 1098-T if you otherwise qualify can demonstrate that you or a dependent were enrolled at an eligible educational institution and can substantiate the payment of qualified tuition related expenses. So that's basically somewhat unusual. You would think most of the time you would be receiving the Form 1098-T. 
So you may also claim one of these educational benefits if the student attended an eligible educational institution required to furnish Form 1090-AT, but the student doesn't receive Form 1090-AT before you file your tax return. For example, if the institution is otherwise required to furnish the Form 1090-AT and doesn't furnish it or refuses to do so, they flat out refuse, hopefully that doesn't happen, and you take the following required steps after January 31st, 2024, but before you file the return, you or the student must request that the educational institution furnish a Form 1098-T. This is the typical kind of scenario when you don't get a form like a 1099 or a W-2 or whatnot. Uh, you want to go after the institution that's supposed to give you it because, again, if you don't get it, they also give it to the IRS and the IRS is typically going to be going off of that form, at least as the baseline for their for for their understanding on their end, what you're going to be reporting on the form 1040. So you must fully cooperate with the educational institution's efforts to gather the information needed to furnish the form 1098 T. You must also otherwise qualify for the benefit, be able to demonstrate that you or a dependent were enrolled at an educational uh, eligible education institution and substantiate the payment of qualifying tuition and related expenses. So obviously you have to be in, in compliance with the rules of the organization in order to get the 1098-T. You have to give them your address. You can't say they didn't give me the form if you didn't give them your address so they can give you the form or an email or something, some way to give you the thing. So the amount of the qualified tuition and related expenses reported on Form 1098-T may not reflect the total amount of the qualified tuition and related expenses paid during the year for which you may claim an education tax credit. So in other words, you get the 1098-T, that at least verifies to the IRS that you're at an institution and attended the institution, and that's verified on their end. However, the amount reported on the 1098-T can't be quite as relied upon as other kinds of forms. This is similar, for example, to like a W-2 form where you can be completely re reliant on it for the most part. Whatever's on a W-2 form, you have to basically put into the tax return exact or else the IRS will probably question it. And if it's not right, you got to go back to the employer to kind of fix it. But when you talk about, say, like a 1099 form, when you're getting non-employee compensation, then you're not going to totally take the sum of all your 1099 forms, for example, might not match what you report on the Schedule C. You would think whatever you report on the Schedule C would have to be equal to or greater than that sum in order for the IRS to not like question it, right? Uh, so it gives the IRS kind of a guideline, but not the, the bottom line exactly on what you're going to be reporting. Similarly here, the 1098T might be, and often more often is what you would use to basically do your calculations and put into the system. But as we will see in what qualifies for the deductions, there's a lot of like exceptions to that rule. So. You need the 1098-T so the IRS can at least be confident that you had some qualified education that required a 1098-T, but what you report might differ depending on the circumstances to actually calculate the credits. All right. So you may include qualified tuition and related expenses that are not reported on Form 1098-T when claiming one of the related credits if you can substantiate payment of these expenses. You may not include expenses paid on Form 1098-T that have been paid by qualified scholarship, including those that were not uh, processed by the university. So if you got a scholarship or something, then you basically got money, you paid for the tuition with money that you didn't have to include in income. So you would think that you can't also get a credit for that because that would kind of be double dipping. Caution, to claim the American Opportunity Credit, you must provide the Educational Institution's Employer Identification Number on a uh, Form 8863. So that's the same kind of number that like an employer would have. They have their number, like a social security number for the institution. They should provide that to you. You should be able to get this information from Form 1098-T. So it should be fairly straightforward on the 1098-T. You have the number, you could put it into the system. So if they give you the form like they should, that should be easy to do. Ban on claiming the American Opportunity Credit. So if you claim the American Opportunity Credit 
uh, even though you're not eligible, you may be banned from claiming the, Ameri the credit depending on your conduct. See the caution statement under American Opportunity Credit later. So we've seen this if you saw in a prior presentation or section uh, or course, we talked about the earned income credit, for example, and the child tax credit, where those credits, especially since they have this large refundable portion to them acting like a benefit or safety net program as opposed to a reduction of the tax in those cases are largely subject to people that want to create fraud or commit fraud so these credits are a big area of concern for people lying and committing fraud about their taxes and so the irs wants to put some safeguards up against that so you want to make sure that you understand the IRS might be looking at these calculations a little bit more closely due to that problem with fraud and putting you know penalties in place. Remembering that penalties for taxes are kind of like penalties for speeding on the road. Meaning if you speed on the road, you're probably not going to get caught because there's not always a police officer around. The idea is that if you speed on the road all the time, you're going to get caught at some point. And when you do, the penalty should be high enough to deter a reasonable actor from speeding in the future because they because the one time they get caught, you, you get hit pretty hard. Now, obviously, a lot of people aren't reasonable actors and they're crazy. So so that, so that doesn't work in those cases. But that's kind of the idea of a lot of the laws. So taxpayer identification number, the TIN needed by due date of return so if you haven't been issued a tin by the due date of your 2023 return including extensions you can't claim the american opportunity credit on either your original or amended 2023 return also the american opportunity credit isn't allowed on either your original or and amended 2023 return for a student who hasn't been issued a tin by due date of your 2023 return including extension so we need an identification number of course and when we're thinking about the identification number needed note that we have who can claim the credit for the expenses who could have been going to school? Well, it could have been you as the taxpayer. Possibly it could have been your spouse, right? And possibly it could have been a dependent. Usually it's somebody reported on the return of the family that's on one return, a married couple with a kid or something like that. That would be either of the taxpayers, spouse, taxpayer, and or dependent, usually the people that are actually going to school. So form 8862 may be required. So if your American Opportunity Credit was denied or reduced for any reason other than math or clerical error for any tax year beginning after 2015, you must attach a completed Form 8862 information to claim certain credits after disallowance to your tax return for the next year for which you claim the credit. You can see Form 8862 and its instructions for details. General instructions. All right, what's the purpose of the form? You got to use the form 8863 to figure and claim your education credits, which are based on adjusted qualified education expenses paid to an eligible educational institution. That's the post-secondary institution, another word for, in essence, college generally. For 2023, there are two education credits. You got the American Opportunity Credit, part of which may be refundable. So that's the refundable portion, meaning... If your tax liability goes below zero, you still could get part of that as a benefit acting not as a refund in that case, but as a social welfare program or benefit safety net program. Then you got the lifetime learning credit. There's no re non-refundable component here. So most of the time, the American Opportunity Credit gives more benefits than the lifetime learning. So we try to pick that one up first, but the requirements are more strict so if I don't qualify for that, then we go for the lifetime learning. That's the thought process typically. So a refundable credit can give you a refund, which isn't really a refund at that case because you didn't really pay taxes. You're getting a benefit even though you're not paying taxes, but that's what we call it on the tax return. A refund when the credit is more than the tax you owe, even if you aren't required to file a tax return. A non-refundable credit can reduce your tax but any excess isn't uh, refunded to you. That's our definition of refundable, non-refundable credits. We've emphasized multiple times and will continue to do so. 
So both of these credits have different rules that, uh, that can affect your eligibility to claim a specific credit. These differences are shown in table one. All right, here's a quick rundown of the table, and then we'll go into some of these uh, in more detail. So caution, you can claim both the American Opportunity Credit and Lifetime Learning Credit on the same return, but not for the same student. So in other words, usually we think about these things, we're gonna go for the American Opportunity Credit first, and then the lifetime learning credit. But you can imagine a situation where you could get both credits because you might, for example, have two dependents both going to school or one of the taxpayers, the spouse is going to school and a dependent or something like that. And possibly if the spouse is going to school, maybe they no longer qualify for the American Opportunity Credit, but they qualify for the lifetime learning credit. But then the student still does qualify for the American Opportunity Credit. So because they're two different expenses, right? They're not for the same uh, expenses. You might be able to take both credits, but you can't take both the American Opportunity Credit and the lifetime learning credit for one institution or one student that's going to one institution, right? You have to, okay. So here we got the American Opportunity Credit versus the Lifetime Learning. So the maximum credit, so American Opportunity up to 2,500 credit per eligible student, whereas the Lifetime Learning up to 2,000 credit uh, per return. So we have a substantial difference on the per return per eligible student. Then we've got the limit on modified adjusted gross income. So it phases out 100, American Opportunity Credit, 180,000 if married filing jointly, 90,000 if single, head of household or qualifying surviving spouse. Lifetime Learning, 180,000 if married filing joint, and then we have the same phase out, 90,000 if single, head of household or qualifying. And then we've got the refundable or non-refundable. So we have the American Opportunity Credit, we are, or where we have 40% of the credit may be refundable. This is, uh, the rest is non-refundable. So part of it might still give us a benefit even if our tax liability goes to zero, but lifetime learning credit, non-refundable, not gonna give us a benefit if our tax liability goes to zero, below zero, right? It's not gonna give us still benefit past that point. Number of years of post-secondary education, American Opportunity Credit, uh, available only if the student had not completed the first four years of post-secondary education. So that's kind of like the, the standard of what you're supposed to take for, for, the, for you know, college. So they give you the four years. But the lifetime learning credit, lifetime learning in the name here, available for all years of post-secondary education and for courses to acquire or improve job skills. So number of tax years credit available, American opportunity, available only for four tax years per eligible student. Now you might think of these first two like are the same, but they're not exactly the same because this requirement up top available only if students had not completed the first four years of post-secondary education. You can kind of think of that as, are they a freshman, sophomore, uh, or senior, you know, and so on. Whereas here, it's possible to be kind of like categorized, I guess, as like a freshman for multiple years because even though you've been going to the school for five years, you haven't completed enough credits to, to go past basically freshman status or something like that. So, so these two are actually possibly could be different in nature even though they both have the four tax, the four years. Available for an unlimited number of years, the lifetime learning credit, again, given by the name. Type of program required. So for the American Opportunity Credit, the student must be pursuing a program leading to a degree or other recognized educational credential. But the Lifetime Learning Credit, student doesn't need to be pursuing a program leading to a degree or other recognized educational credits. Right? I could be taking bowling or something. I don't know. I don't think bowling would qualify, but still, I'll give it a shot. I want to learn to bowl. So number of courses. American Opportunity Credit. Student must be enrolled in at least half time for at least one academic period beginning during 2023 or the first three months of 2024 if the qualified expenses were paid in 2023. We'll talk about those cutoff dates a little bit more later. Lifetime Learning Credit available for one or more courses. And then we've got the felony drug conviction. So they kind of threw this one in here even though it doesn't really relate to these two credits because you know, that they, they, they was just a political thing at the time. So American Opportunity Credit, as of the end of 2023, the student had not been convicted of a felony for possessing or distributing a controlled substance. 
Oh man, that's why they were going to college in the first place to distribute. The di no, that's why that's why that's there. You see, that's why that's there. Lifetime learning credit, felony drug conviction. Uh, don't make the student ineligible for that one. So then we've got the qualified expenses. So American opportunity credit, tuition, required enrollment fees and course materials that the student needs for a course of study, whether or not the materials are bought at the educational institution as a condition of enrollment or attendance. We'll talk more about that later. The lifetime learning credit, however, a bit different. Tuition and required enrollment fees, including amounts required to be paid to the institution for course-related books, supplies, and equipment. All right, then we have the payment or academic periods. American Opportunity Credit. Payments made in 2023 for the academic period beginning in 2023 or beginning in the first three months of 2024. There's that cutoff thing. We'll talk more about that later. That's for both the American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning Credit. Because, of course, when you pay for the tuition, you might pay for it before you actually start uh, that, the school year. So TIN needed by filing due date. So, fi so American Opportunity Credit. Filers and students must have been issued a TIN by the due date of their 2023 return, including extensions, lifetime learning. Students must have been issued a TIN by the due date of their 2023 return, including extensions. And then we got the educational institutions, EIN, the number for them, basically like the institution social security number. Uh, I think they're both the same, right? So, so let's go. American Opportunity Credit. You must provide the educational institution's employer identification number on your Form 8863 for the lifetime learning credit. Educational institution's employer identification number is not required on uh, your Form 8863. All right. Who can claim the education credit? You may be able to claim an education credit if you, your spouse, or a dependent can claim on your tax return was a student enrolled at or attending an eligible educational institution, which kind of makes sense. Someone reported on the tax return, taxpayer, spouse, dependents, dependents age limit possibly being extended if they are going uh, to college and then they have qualified educational institution expenses, right? For which they're gonna get a form 1098-4-T. So for 2023, the credits are based on the amount of adjusted qualified education expenses paid for the student in 2023 for academic periods beginning in 2023 or beginning in the first three months of 2024. So you will recall we're basically on a cash-based system most of the time because that's easier to do, but it's possible that you pay for the school before you actually go to school, which is that prepayment scenario, which the IRS is typically skeptical of because people often take advantage of the prepayment scenario, but because it's kind of standard to start in the first three months, you could say, well, if they paid it in 2023, the tax year, but they didn't start the school until the first three months of the next year because that's typical. We're going to keep that as deductible or part of the calculation for 2023 is the general idea. You can't try to say, hey, school, I'm going to prepay five years of education expenses up front and then try to count that towards your calculation of the credit up front. You'd probably be limited anyways. You wouldn't want to do that in any way, case, but that the, that's what they're trying to do that that's their general concept of this prepayment interplay between accrual and cash based concepts academic period what does that mean an academic period is any quarter semester trimester or any other period of study as uh, reasonably determined by the eligible education institution so many institutions they have their own kind of system so you might be at an institution that's a quarter system, a semester system, a trimester system, those are quite common. Common. You could see more exotic systems than that, but uh, that's the idea. So, so hopefully the school can basically help to determine what, what the system is that's gonna be set up and what are the credits that are gonna be applied to that kind of system to determine whether or not, for example, they're full-time students or not, which could be important if the person is a dependent, for example. So if an eligible ed educational institution uses credit hours or clock hours and doesn't have economic terms, 
Each payment period may be treated as an academic period. For details, see academic period in Chapter 2 and 3 of Publication 970. So who can claim a dependent's uh, expenses? So if a student is claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return, all qualified education expenses of the student are treated as having been paid by that person. So now you have a situation, you've got the, the, usually the parents, but you know you have someone claiming usually the child and the education, so who gets to claim the expenses? Well, if, if the dependent uh, is on another person's tax return, you would think you, the person whose tax return is claiming them, typically the parent, uh, would be able to take advantage of the education expenses. Now, notice that you could get into kind of questions in that scenario in terms of, well, what if like it wasn't the parents that paid for the expenses, but it was like the uncle or something that paid for the expenses? Does the uncle have to pay the the money to the parents so that the parents can then pay it to the educational institution so that they can count it as having been paid by the parents who are actually filing for the credit on the return and usually you would think that's kind of a waste of you you would think no because that that that's just a matter of how the cash is being funneled right so you would think that if the uncle paid directly to the school on behalf of the child, the uncle can't get the educational expenses as a deduction on their return if the, the, if the child isn't a dependent on the uncle's return. The child is dependent on their parent's return. So you would think you would still want to be able to allow the benefit and not have to have this weird kind of, well, now the uncle has to pay the parent to pay the school, but rather the uncle just pays the school, right? And you would think you would still be able to assign those deduct the deductibility or calculation of the credit to whoever's claiming the kid as a dependent that's going to school or the adult or whoever it is all right therefore only that person can claim the education credit for the student if a student isn't claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return only the student can claim the credit so no matter who paid for the student if the student is, is not being claimed as a dependent on someone else's return, no one else can get the benefit because they don't have the dependent on their return, but the student then might be able to claim the benefit at, at that point. All right, expenses paid by a third party. Here we go with that third party. Uh, qualified education expenses paid on behalf of the student by someone other than the student, such as a relative like the uncle, are treated as paid by the student. So however, qualified education expenses paid or treated as paid by a student who is claimed as a dependent on your tax return are treated as paid by you. So therefore, you're treated as having paid expenses that were paid by the third party. So that's the whole thing I was talking about, right? So you don't have to say, okay, the uncle has to pay the parent. So the parent pays the college because if the uncle pays directly to the college, then the money didn't come from the person who's filing the tax return. No, the assumption is basically gonna be whoever is claiming the person that went to school and had the expenses is the one that gets the benefit of the amount that was paid to calculate the credit because that's the easiest thing to do so you don't have this crazy kind of cash flow thing to worry about. So for more information and an example, you can see who can claim a dependent's expense in publication 970. We might look at that in a little bit more detail, chapter two and three. So who cannot claim a credit? You cannot claim an education credit on 2023 tax return if any of the following apply. You've, you're claimed as a dependent on another person's tax return, such as your parents. Then you can't claim the credit. Your parents can claim possibly the credit. So your filing status is married filing separately. Remember that if you're married, you could choose to marry filing separate, but you might lose benefits such as the credits because the IRS is skeptical that you're going to do that just to try to take advantage of AGI limitations, for example. So you or your spouse were a non-resident alien for any part of 2023 and didn't elect to be treated as a resident alien for tax purposes. Your modified adjusted gross income, MAGI, is 180,000 or more if filing jointly or 90,000 or more if single head of household or qualifying surviving spouse with dependent child. So there's an income phase out as your income goes up. The student has not been issued a TIN by the due date of their 2023 return, including extensions. Generally, your modified adjusted gross income 
is the amount on your form 1040, 1040 SR line 11. However, so what does the modified mean? So it's your adjusted gross income. But uh, however, if you're filing form 2555 for foreign earned income, that's always kind of throwing a wrench in the situation whenever you have that foreign income or form 4563, exclusion of income from bona fide residents of America, Samoa, or are excluding income from Puerto Rico, uh, add to the amount on your form 1040, 1040 SR line 11, the amount of income you excluded. For details there, you can see publication 970.